technology. How is it going to affect language learning? Some people think it's going to make learning languages unnecessary, which I don't believe, but it is going to have an effect on language learning and no question. So I would like to review what I consider to be the sort of four key elements of efficient use of technology to improve our outcomes in language learning. What I call the pace of change in language learning technology. By pace, I refer to portability, adaptability, connectivity, and efficiency. Those are the four ingredients, and these are the things that I will be looking for going forward. So first of all, I'd like to review historically what has happened when it comes to language learning technology. We don't know, at least I don't know that much about how people learned languages in ancient Greece or Mesopotamia or Egypt. There are some indications that it was largely based either on reading texts with translations or very small groups of students studying with a teacher or simply interacting with speakers of other languages, bearing in mind that only a small number of people were traveling unless they were part of a, you know, a, an invasion of a neighboring country or merchants that traveled, but the bulk of people, they simply lived and died in their little village and had limited opportunity to connect with speakers of other languages. So what has happened over the years? Well, we see a move towards more portability. Pencils came along, printing came along. We're no longer dependent on writing materials, which were perhaps papyrus or papyrus, however it's pronounced, was cheaper in Egypt, but more expensive in Greece. Our people were, you know, using uh, some kind of clay tablets, but it wasn't very portable. And over the years, our ability to write things down, eventually to record things in terms of recording audio, recording video, uh, right up until the last 45 years, has been a movement towards more portability, more connectivity, adaptability in the sense of increasing the ability of the learner to access content of interest, to sort of concentrate on needs or perceived needs or a style of learning that uh, suited his tastes or her tastes, and I think to some degree increasing efficiency. However, we're still basically back at the same model as in ancient Mesopotamia, Greece, Egypt, and that is that we need the input, we need to find an opportunity to use the language, our brains haven't changed, we are still essentially the same people as those people back in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, you name it. So, is that going to change going forward? Is there more talk about information technology? Whereas in reality, we're still facing the same difficulties. And when I say the same difficulties, I refer back to this idea that language learning amounts to motivation on the part of the learner and time. The amount of time available to learn and the efficiency with which we learn with you know a limited amount of time. Those two key factors haven't changed. So how has information technology or modern technology changed that? If I look at it from my own experience, what was to me revolutionary was initially the mini disc player, then followed by the MP3 player. That made audio portable. The next big thing was of course the availability of online texts where you could quickly look material up in a dictionary. This is kind of at the origin of Link. It made it possible to manipulate text, to manipulate audio, which was, you know, revolutionary from my perspective. What we now see is that social media is a major form of technical innovation when it comes to language learning. I can go to YouTube, find podcasts or YouTube channels with very interesting material on a variety of subjects in just about any language. And uh, here again, with the introduction of uh, automatic translation or automatic uh, transcription services, uh, we can access this material and use it for our language learning. We can also connect, as is this example, with this uh, very interesting podcast that I found in Levantine Arabic, where I saw an interview with a Lebanese entrepreneur who mentioned that he was active on Instagram. So I went and looked him up on Instagram. I don't know what it does in terms of the efficiency of my learning, but it is a form of engagement because I am able to find content of interest and I'm able to learn about different aspects of say Lebanon, the difficulties they had during the Lebanese Civil War, the extent to which many of the sort of 
entrepreneurs and intellectuals have moved to the, the Emirates. And all of a sudden I'm interested in the Emirates and I'm thinking, hey, maybe I should go and visit there. And so there's a lot of engagement through this phenomenon of social media. If I look at the speed of change over the last 40 years, say from 1980, bearing in mind that I learned Chinese back in 1968 when we had the open reel uh, tape recorders. But if I look at the speed of change that has happened, guaranteed this sort of pace of change is going to continue to accelerate. And I should mention in that regard, just how useful a service chat GPT is. Not only can I go to chat GPT and ask, can you recommend a podcast in Spanish on uh, the economy or on agriculture or on research into cancer and they will find a podcast. I've done it. So that's in terms of, again, adaptability, finding content that is, you know, personalized to my interests. But uh, insofar as efficiency, I find that in language learning conjunctions, connecting words are very useful. They kind of form key elements in the sort of patterns of the language. So if I ask, give me the 20 most common conjunctions in Levantine Arabic with five examples for each and almost instantly that's produced. If I wanted to conjugate a verb or decline a noun in any language that I'm learning, chat GPT will give me that right away. I even asked the difference between augmented reality and uh, virtual reality, and they gave me an explanation of that as well, which you can easily do. And this is something that I've done, by the way, here on my uh, YouTube channel, is to get on there with a bunch of other people and we pretend we're something else and, and we're speaking and I'm talking to an animal or something, I don't know. Or I see pictures of people in a classroom with these virtual reality glasses on and they are able to project themselves into an, a, an environment which I guess to some people might be perceived as an immersion in that other, in the language environment. Personally, I find it a bit strange to be doing that. If I'm in a classroom, I'd rather interact with the other people in the classroom. But it's possible that in terms of engagement, people who are bored in a classroom will find it more interesting to put on their virtual reality goggles to project themselves into a cafe in Paris or a noodle shop in Tokyo. And again, this gets back to this idea of adaptability. Increasingly, people will be able to do the things that they like doing. Although people would have to buy these goggles unless the classroom provided it. But I think that uh, with increasing adaptability, it's increasingly possible for people to study things that are of interest to them in ways that they like on their own. And the, the idea of the classroom, if we get back to you know, ancient Greece where the, presumably the tutor or the teacher was in charge of everything. And certainly that's been the pattern in our classrooms. And to a large extent, the teaching community wants to protect that role where the teacher is in charge. I think that's going to be one of the results of uh, increasing availability of other tools. People can design their own language learning path, find their own content, pursue those aspects of the language that are most interesting to them. Augmented reality, in contrast to virtual reality, from what I understand, is the idea that uh, wherever you are, say you're in China and you see a bunch of stuff written on a menu, you can immediately see that in your language, or maybe it, be con it can be converted into audio, or there's different ways that the reality that you are experiencing can be either converted into something that's easier for you to understand, or is something that can be a learning opportunity. Again, I am not sort of that much into those things. I am, as you know, more focused on input-based learning. So I asked ChatGPT to write me a story in Spanish about a person going through a difficult divorce. Uh, I'm not going through a divorce, by the way, difficult or otherwise, but I just thought it would be an example of a very specific sort of context. And almost immediately chat GPT writes this story. I could use uh, text-to-speech technology to listen to that story. We at, at Link regularly, when I import uh, podcasts, they are you know transcribed and timestamped so that I can study that text uh, sentence by sentence in Link. So that's another form or another way of how we use you know artificial intelligence to make language learning content portable because I can see it on my iPhone more adaptable or more personalized. Connecting, I'm connecting to someone in, from Lebanon who now lives in Abu Dhabi uh, and it's efficient. So, uh, you know, these different applications of information technology do match this, these sort of four criteria.
Now, in all of that, there are some applications which I don't care for, but others might. For example, I'm not into quizzes. So there was one application, uh, I think it was a Busu Alexa or something where you could be quizzed while working in the kitchen. I'm not interested in being quizzed. That's not my style. I'm not interested in pretending to speak to someone, but there are people who like that. I still stick with the idea that just as with artificial intelligence, the ability, uh, say, of chat GPT to answer questions apparently is based on its ability to predict the next word based on maybe a hundred words back, they're able to predict what the next word is going to be. And that's how they're able to answer. I don't, I must admit, don't understand it. I'm sure some of you understand it better, but apparently this is very similar to how the human brain processes language. And the more this model of automatic transcription or any automatic text generation, the more it's based on this predictive ability, the more similar it is to the way the brain learns. Interesting, by the way, that I've always experienced the fact that nouns are easier to remember and easier to learn than verbs. And there are apparently various reasons for this. But one of the interesting things that comes out of research that I discovered while preparing for this is that verbs are much more dependent on context. In other words, we need to see a variety, a diverse range of contexts with any particular verb in order to be able to remember that verb. Whereas nouns, it's more a matter of frequency. So the high frequency nouns normally learn them more quickly. But in any case, our ability to produce the language is based on what we have in our memory one way or another. And so while many people want to speak the language, as you've heard me say many times, I don't consider that a big priority. Rather, I want to build up this capability within myself to have that language in memory. And as I start using it, as I have a, a meaningful opportunity to use it, I'll get better and better at using it. And in that sense, that method of learning is more similar to what they used to do in ancient Greece, apparently, where the emphasis was on reading texts with translation. So obviously technology has moved a long way since ancient Greece. And I think it's going to this, the pace again, P-A-C-E, the pace of innovation is going to accelerate where I'm certainly using whatever I can use to help me in my language learning. I'm sure you're doing the same. And it's an exciting time to be involved in language learning. So uh, with that, I'll leave you the video where I was involved in this uh, virtual reality uh, experiment. And uh, one other video that I think is relevant to this discussion. I look forward to your comments. Thank you.